guys can be seated. Go ahead and be seated. What an honor it is for me to be up here and uh, share a word with you this Wednesday night. Are you guys excited that you came to the house of God today? Can you guys make some noise for Jesus? Amen. Amen. Well, I believe I prepared a special word for you guys that you definitely need to hear. Uh, but before I get started, I do again want to honor Pastor Omar and the pastoral staff uh, for giving me the privilege to preach up here. Uh, but before I get started, I do want to open up in prayer. So, uh, Lord, we just thank you, God, for what you're doing here in our midweek service. We pray, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit just to move, Lord God. I pray every heart in here will be open, Lord God, ready to receive what you have tonight, Lord God. But we just pray, Jesus, that you just change the atmosphere. We pray that your Holy Spirit is here right now, Lord God, already working in us, Lord, already working in those that need to hear a message tonight, Lord God. We pray, Jesus, that tonight, Lord, that you will just change our hearts, change our minds, change our spirits, Lord God. And I pray that the lives that you change tonight, that you will receive all glory. We just want to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, before I get into my message, I do want to share a story. We're in a sermon series called Made for More. Uh, and I have a, a, a funny story I want to share with you. Uh, before This is before um, I met my wife when uh, I, had, I had the hots for her and she didn't have it for me. Uh, you know, we, we just came out of a, a men's um, um, discipleship on Monday uh, and, and they kept on saying, you are the one, you know, you're the one, I'm the one. And it was a great message, but uh, this day I thought I was the one and uh, I, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share it with you. So I was a new convert coming to church, and my, my wife was working with the youth at the time. She didn't even know who I was, and uh, I was trying to impress her, and I was like, oh, I can play, I can play football. So we were at a, a church picnic, and uh, it was an event, and uh, the youth were going to play uh, uh, flag football. So I was like, I thought she was going to play, so I decided to join and, and, and play. And I think the moment I joined, she was like, no, I'm not going to play. She ended up going to go hang out. So I was like, all right, well, I'm stuck here playing football, and... Uh, I was playing with these kids, and, and last week, Pastor Omar shared a message. He said, you know, the church is the body. We need to be united. And, um, and I remember they threw a pass to me, and I caught the ball, and I was like, this is it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show my wife how good I am in sports, uh, you know, my future wife anyways. And, and I, I caught the ball, and I remember there was a, a teenager right in front of me, and my body and mind was not united at this very moment, amen? So I caught the ball, and I'm like, I'm going to do a spin move in my head. My, my, my mind was telling me I can do this move, this true story. And, and my legs and my body and my back was saying, no, you can't. So I just remember, I remember I caught the ball and I did the spin move. And I, I turned around, I made it to the end zone and my body just collapsed. I broke my back, basically. I, 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 pulled, I pulled these muscles in my back. I think you can ask Christian and, and my wife. This is a true story. And I remember I hurt myself so bad. I was just laying there looking at the sky at, at, at a church picnic. And I remember the teenagers were just like looking over me like, hey, are you all right? You know? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. But I couldn't move. And I had to stay there for a couple minutes. So I told everyone, just go, go have a good time. And I remember laying there. I remember laying there and I was like, wow. You know? And, and then you know how when you, when you kind of still think that, that you know, that, that, that future girlfriend or your future wife, she's, she's kind of looking at you. And I kind of like looked to see if she was going to come. Kind of rolled over. Like, did she notice me? Is she going to check if I'm okay? None of that happened. It was all in my mind. But, uh. I'll tell you what, at that very moment, I wasn't the one, amen? I, I totally made a fool of myself. But hey, what does Pastor Armour say? We fail forward, amen? I kept on trying. I ended up getting the girl, and I got my wife, so. I wanted to share that. Baby, I love you. Thank you for giving me the time to, to share tonight. Uh, you're the world to me. You take care of our beautiful kids. Without you, um, I wouldn't be here. I want to be the man that I am, so thank you, and I just want to honor you. Let's give it up for Maui. But again, we're, we're in a sermon series called Made for More, and I really wanted to just focus on one person in the Bible, and we all heard his name. Um, his name is Joseph. He's been, he, he went through a lot, but I think tonight we can really learn from him on, on how we can be made for more. So, um, you know, Pastor Omar says that this is a man that went to the pit, to the prison, and to the palace, and I'm going to go and go ahead and start in Genesis 37, and I'm going to read 1 through 11. So... Um, it starts with, so Joseph settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived. I'm sorry, Jacob has settled in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived. A foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended to his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of the father's wives, uh, Bila and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his, his brothers were doing. So he was a tattletale, guys. 
Uh, we call him a dime dropper. Do you guys know why, why you call Tattletail a dime dropper? Back in the day, um, if you watch movies, there, there used to be pay phones. And if you were a rat and calling the cops, you would go to the pay phone, you would drop a dime in, and you would call the cops. So if you're being called the dime dropper, you're, you're a tattletale, okay? You're a snitch. So, <laughs> so Joseph was a dime dropper, amen? So Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field trying, uh, tying up bundles of, of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of this, these dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have another dream. He said, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well, as his brothers, as his father asked to his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of a dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? While his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father uh, wondered what this dream meant. And before I go any further, I do want to mention some dynamics of this family. See, Jacob had 13 children, 12 boys, one girl, and all of them were from uh, four different women. And Jacob had his, fa his favorite, which was Rachel, and she couldn't have kids, so Jacob ended up having kids um, with the other three women. Then Rachel was able to bear a son, and his first, her first son was Joseph, and then Benjamin. Joseph was the 11th born son and had 10 older half-brothers. And because Joseph was from Rachel, Jacob loved him the most. That bothered the other brothers, and that was some there was some jealousy there. That was also the reason why Jacob had a special coat made for his son Joseph. Now, when I think about this, I can just think about what Jacob, what his mind would be going through when he would come home. Uh, when I come home, sometimes I, I get the, the, the third degree, like, you need to talk to your boys. They've been fighting all day. Uh, you need to talk to your daughter. She's giving me attitude. Why did you come home late? Why is the trash still not out? You go on and on and on, you know? <laughs> Where were you? How come you didn't tell me you were going to work late? But I could imagine times that by four, what Jacob probably went through, amen? So I was like, wow, I can barely handle my wife, but God bless you, baby. I love you. <laughs> You, you might be asking right now, what is so important about this dynamic fam family? And if I can be honest here, I believe that there are people right now that can relate to a family like this. I believe there's a lot of similarities here, certain circumstances that we have in our families. Some of us may not know who our dad is. Some of us may be living with a, step, a stepdad. Some of us may be living with a stepmom. Some of us may, be, may not have any parents and you probably have odds with your brother or sister or maybe a cousin or an uncle. Whatever the case may be, the dynamic in your family isn't what you think it is. It, it's not the perfect family that you visualize, but actually there's a lot of stuff going on that I believe that we can definitely learn from through the life of Joseph. So the circumstances isn't the first time God has seen something like that. So I want you guys to know, God has seen this before. So whatever's going on in your family, maybe you're in a rough situation, you're the only one saved, and, and you're just going through a lot, and, and, and you just don't know how to get out of it. I just want to encourage you today that God is here for you. And Pastor Omar once said in one of his sermons, he says, God's will for your life can still be done despite all the dysfunction. I wanna tell you that again. God's will for your life can still be done despite all the dysfunction that's going on in your family. Don't count yourself out and say what, what good can come out of me or what good can come out of my family. God can move over your life and in your situation and in your circumstance, and I believe he can move tonight, amen? So I just wanna encourage you, don't count yourself out. Whatever the situation is, however dynamic the family may be or however uh, 
crazy your family may be, amen. We all come from a crazy family. I believe we all can relate. But Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things that he had planned for us long ago. So I want you to know God has a plan for your life. God wants to move in your life. I need you to tell somebody next to you right now that God has more for your life. Tell your neighbor right now, God has more for your life. I want you to know that the same way Jacob looked at his son Joseph, that's the way God sees you. He sees someone unique, he sees somebody special, he sees someone he can't stop thinking about. He cares so much for you. And Jacob saw something special in Joseph and that explains his special coat that he got for him. And the the same way Jacob placed that coat on him is the same way God put something special on us. In Galatians 3, 27, it says this, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. You see, just the way Jacob put that jacket on Joseph, that's the same way when we come to Christ and we get saved and we get baptized, God puts a covering on us, amen? And this covering in the family, it represents authority, it represents love, it represents uh, uh, just God's favor, amen? And when you have the coat of Christ on, the favor of God comes on you, amen? So I just wanna encourage you to continue moving forward for the kingdom. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus, and we are made perfect in him, amen? In Zephaniah 3.17, it says this, for the Lord your God is living among you, He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in your gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Now that's the God I serve, amen? He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. You see, God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. He wants to know more of you. He wants better for your life. He wants to open up the doors of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. And I just wanna encourage you to keep pushing on because God has more for your life, amen? So I I just wanna give a little bit more details on what's going on here. The very next uh, um Um, paragraphs, we see that Joseph's brothers, they have so much animosity and hate towards towards Joseph that they want to kill him. Um, In verse 18, it says this, when Joseph's brother saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance as he approached. They made plans for, for to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. See, you can see that the brothers were jealous of Joseph to the point where they wanted to kill him. But it it was Reuben who changed their minds and threw Joseph into a pit to sell him into slavery. Now, um, when I was studying this message and putting it together, uh, I kind of went through my phone and through my notes and I found this very powerful message from Pastor Omar a few years back uh, called Legacy. Um, And these are Pastor Omar's notes here. He says, how do you get to the point of selling your brother to human traffickers, to be a slave to Egypt? How do you get to this point? He goes on to say, I, I kind of want to change your perspective here. We know Joseph had the love and favor of, of their father, and it spilled over to the brothers. But let me ask you, how would you feel if one of your bro- uh, how would you feel? Sorry, I lost my place. How would you feel if your father had another woman he loved more than your mom? How would you feel if your little brother became your supervisor? And, Or how would you feel that no matter how hard you worked, no matter how good you did, no matter what you did to try to please your dad, you would never get the same love that he has for another one of your brothers? You see, it was bitterness and it was like a poison that eats inside of you. Pastor Omar shared in that message a quote from Nelson Mandela. And it says, and Nelson Mandela said this after he was leaving prison. He says, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead me to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in a prison. You see, I wanna encourage you that if you want more for God, if you want God to do more in your life, we have to learn to get rid of bitterness, to get rid of anger, to get rid of hate. See, all that stuff isn't from God and it'll weigh you down. It'll cause confusion, it'll cause division, not only in your home and in your family, but in the church. Uh, If you have bitterness, you gotta learn to ask God to let it go. And sometimes it, sometimes, you know, we get hurt, that's fine, we do get churched, but we gotta keep on going and asking God, God, give me the strength to forgive, to, to give me the strength to continue to move forward to love my brother the way you love my brother or love my sister the way you love my sister. We can't hold on to bitterness because all it's gonna do is drag and follow us and we're not gonna get anywhere because we're holding on to so much hatred towards our brothers. Ephesians uh, 4.31 says this, get rid of all bitterness, 
rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has also forgiven you. You see, if you want to do more for God and be used more, we have to get rid of bitterness. We have to get, bit, get rid of hatred and anger. God called us to be better, not bitter. The brothers go back to their dad, uh, Jacob, and they lie to him. After they, they threw their brother into a pit, they sold him into slavery. Now they have to go back to their dad and tell him that Joseph is dead. They basically made up this lie. They grabbed Joseph's coat. They ended up slaughtering um, a goat and they, they poured blood all over this jacket and they brought it back to their dad and they said that he was devoured and eaten by a wild animal. And in Genesis 37, 34 says this, then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. And verse 35 says this, his family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. You see, tonight, I wanna encourage you guys that no matter the hurt, no matter the guilt, no matter the shame, no matter what you've been going through, I believe because Jacob refused comfort, he had lost hope in his, in his favorite son and his favorite son was gone. Maybe you have been in a place where you have lost hope. Maybe you have been in a place where you see things now that they can't turn around. And I wanna encourage you today, don't lose hope. God has a plan for you. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. God's gonna move on your behalf. You gotta continue moving. You gotta continue to keep going. And Joshua 1.9, it says this, do not be afraid. Do not lose hope. I am the Lord your God, and I will be with you everywhere. This is God's promise that he's there with you through your times of troubles, through your time, times of struggles. Even when you've lost all hope, God can move in your circumstance, and he can change your circumstance around. Amen? See, Joseph was taken to Egypt, and he was bought by Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and a captain of the guard, and the favor of, of God was with Joseph. Because the favor of God was on Joseph, he became successful and and so did the house of Potiphar. Now see, when you just continue to, to pivot and keep your focus on God, no matter the circumstance, no matter the trial, you're gonna see that you're gonna continue to be able to move forward. You're gonna, see, you're gonna be able to understand, okay, God, I'm in this position for a reason. There's something you're trying to teach me here. I know you're, 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 you're molding me and shaping me to be better, so I'm just gonna continue to follow you. I'm gonna continue to keep moving, amen? And in Genesis 39 two, it says this, it says, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of, the, of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. You see, because he still had the mindset of, of continuing to move him forward and continuing to please God, you see that the favor of God fell upon him. You see, he wasn't you know, staying in the pit and being bitter, like, I can't believe my, my brother sold me into slavery. Um, yes, he was hurt, and yes, he was broken, but he knew that there was more that God wanted for him, so he continued to move, move forward, and he continued to have the right perspective. You see, we have to have the right perspective. You know, we can, it's easy to fall into the wrong perspective and have a pity party and, and look at the bad things, but if you can continue looking on the good things, hey, Joseph probably said, I'm still alive, I'm still healthy, I can still move, and look, now I'm working in this Egyptian's house, and because of the favor of God fell upon him, uh, Potiphar actually gave him basically access to his whole house. He was blessed beyond measure. He, uh, he could do whatever he wanted, go in and out of the house. And, and, and because of the faith that he had in God, God moved in his life and the favor followed and people noticed the favor of God on his life. Now it says that Joseph was handsome, like me, amen, in, in the form of appearance. And after a while, Potiphar's wife had basically, this is my words, had the hots for him. So she approached him and asked him to lie with her. He refused and said, I'm not going to betray my master. And how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? It goes on to say that she grabbed him and pulled him off his outer garments and he ran. See, I wanna let you know something. If you wanna do more for God, you gotta set limitations, amen? You gotta stay away from temptation. You gotta stay away from the bars, amen? If you, if you struggle with drinking, you gotta stay away from people who smoke. If they smoke, you know, during breaks, go to the other side, you know, go somewhere else. Go eat, go eat a hot dog or something, you know? <laughs> when temptation comes, you know, we have to, we have to, <laughs> we have to, Follow Joseph's example. You see, the woman grabbed him and took off his garment, and the Bible says that he ran. The Bible says that we need to flee temptation, amen? In 2 Timothy 2, it says this, run from anything that stimulates your youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteousness, righteousness, 
uh, righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. You see, Joseph, no matter what was going on, he always kept his focus on God. He wasn't having a pity party and always did what was right and pleasing toward God. Am I going to be okay with God? He continued to ask. Is this thing that I'm gonna do, is it gonna please God or is it gonna displease God? You see, what are you asking yourself when you wake up every morning? God, I wanna please you? Or, or are you saying, God, could you bless me? You know, see, we gotta have the right attitude when we serve God, amen? We serve God because we're here to please him. We're here to thank him for what he's done in our life. You know, the Bible says that um, his, his mercies are new every morning. So when we wake up, we gotta, we gotta wake up with the, with the shout of praise, with the shout to honor him. And, and we gotta make sure that he's there for us every step of the way. So, you have to set a standard, and, and, and each of us need to have a certain standard. Pastor Omar shared in one of his messages, he said you have to have a code of ethics. You gotta tell yourself what you're gonna do. Are you gonna go all in for God? Then that means you need to stay away from her. You need to stay away from this. You can't drink that no more. You're not gonna go smoke that anymore. You're not gonna go hang around this crowd anymore. You gotta set a standard for your life that you know God doesn't want you to be around and you gotta make sure that the, uh, the standard for your life is pleasing and acceptable to God. You gotta, you gotta understand that, is, is this what I'm doing? Is God gonna be okay with this decision? That's what you gotta ask yourself. With every choice that you make, are you asking yourself that? Is God gonna bless this if I make the right decision? Or are you gonna say, you know what, I can make a quick dollar, right? Or, 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 or it, may, it may be beneficial right now. No one's gonna know, you see, um, we gotta make sure that God sees everything, amen? No matter what, God sees all. And we see that there was a burden on Joseph's heart that he, he knew that there was nobody in the house but him and Potiphar's wife. Who knows if somebody could have found out, but there was a burden on his heart. There was something inside of him that says, no, I am not gonna sin against God, and I'm not gonna sin against my master that has been blessing me, amen? So he took off and ran. And Proverbs 13, 21, it says this, trouble chases sinners while blessing uh, while blessings reward the righteous. You see, as Joseph made that standard and made the decision to do what is right before God, you see the favor of God continued to follow him. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, the blessings continued to have favor on Joseph because he made the right choice. And I wanna encourage you guys, set a standard in your life. Do an evaluation of your life on what's pleasing to God. If you're a new believer, do the standard and say, you know what? I'm just gonna surround myself with people at church. Hey, we're here Wednesdays. We get together Fridays for Connect Group. We're here twice on Sundays, amen. Uh, I'm telling you, just continue to come and hang around yourself with Christians and you're gonna catch what they have, amen. But if you continue, if you're new and you continue going home and you have people there that drink and smoke, guess what? You're, 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 you're gonna be prone to fall into those things. So I wanna encourage you to make a standard for yourself that I'm gonna walk this walk and not just talk the talk, amen. So Potiphar's wife um, lies to the master and they send him to prison. God was with Joseph and that was more important to him and he didn't wanna lose sight of that. You see, God was there even during Joseph's hardest times. Joseph was in prison there for two years and, and even though the decision that he made to, to do right by God, put him in prison for two years, I believe he knew that it was worth it, amen? Even though he was in a dungeon, even though he may have been chained up, he still didn't lose sight of pleasing his God, amen? And, and the story goes on to say that there was a cupbearer and a baker that was in there, and both of them had a dream that was troubling to them, and Joseph interpreted them, and basically he said this, in these two dreams he told uh, the cupbearer, in three days the cupbearer would get his job back, and for the baker in three days he would die, unfortunately. But he says that to the cupbearer, when it came to pass and he was released, he told the cupbearer this, don't forget about me, and of course the cupbearer forgets about him, and he's stuck in prison for another two years. I'm just gonna get some water. So I wanna ask you guys tonight, maybe tonight you might feel like you've been forgotten. Maybe tonight you, you, you may feel like you're left out or you're alone. Maybe you might feel like, like you're in a dark place and no one can find you, no one can see you. I wanna let you know, I promise you, God will not leave you or forsake you. Isaiah 49, 15 says this, never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for her child, for, for the child that she's bore? 
But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. You see, God wants a relationship with you and he won't leave you or forsake you. You gotta know who you are in Christ and you gotta know even if you're, you're in the pit or even if you're in prison, whatever it may be, or even if you're fighting temptation, know that you can always call on the Lord and he'll be there to rescue you, amen? See, the definitive proof of God never forgetting you is Jesus hanging on a cross, giving his life as a ransom because he was thinking about you. He, didn't, he did that so you can receive salvation. You see, if there's anything to remind you about God being with you, think about Jesus on the cross. Think about him suffering for you. Think about him saying, I'm doing this. I'm laying down my life so you can have life and have it more abundantly. I believe if you can picture Jesus on the cross doing this, willingly so that you may have life and have it abundantly. I believe that'll help you understand that you're not alone in this race or in this walk with the Lord, amen? See, two years later, we see that Pharaoh had a dream and no one, no one could um, interpret this dream. Um, so the cupbearer remembered Joseph in prison. So two years later, guys, after he said, don't forget me, uh, that's, that's pretty long, right? So the cupbearer totally forgot about, about Joseph and then uh, we see Pharaoh, the man that he serves, now he's having bad dreams and he's trying to get an interpretation. So we see two years later, we see that Joseph had a dream and no one could help, um, no one could help and explain what, what the dream meant. And the cupbearer remembered Joseph in prison and Pharaoh asked him to interpret his dream. And Joseph told Pharaoh, no, I can't interpret your dream, but God will give you the interpretation. You see, what I like about this is Joseph didn't put the light on himself. Joseph understood that it was God that would help him interpret the dream. You see, too many times we're looking for a clap on the back. We're looking for somebody to say, hey, you did a good job. But the things that we do for the Lord are for him and to glorify him. So Joseph always understood that my life is meaningless. I'm just here to please my God. I'm here to serve my Lord. And, and, and too many times we're looking for people to clap for us. We're looking for people to tell us, hey, you're doing a great job. But at the end of the day, we're here to glorify the Lord. Amen. So Joseph didn't take his giftings for granted, and he, and, he, and he told Pharaoh, even if Pharaoh could have gotten upset, he told Pharaoh, I want you to understand that I'm not the one that's gonna interpret the dream, but it's my God that's gonna give you the help that you need. And, and Joseph chose to shine the light on God and not himself, because everything we do is for God's glory, amen? Now, I just wanna uh, share a little bit about this. Um, so, um, Joseph interprets this dream, and basically it comes down to this. It comes down to uh, Joseph letting Pharaoh know that there's gonna be seven years of prosperity in the land of Egypt. And then after that, there will be seven more years of drought. And he said that he should place somebody in charge to, pre to prepare for the drought and make sure that they're taking rations from all the crops every single year and putting them away in a safe place. And, and he asked Pharaoh if he can find someone to put in that place. And because of the favor of God, we see that Pharaoh decided to pick him to watch over all of the crops, to watch over all of the food within the next basically 14 years. So for time's sake, I do wanna say this, that the, the severe famine hit and it caused Jacob's family to come to Egypt to buy food for the family. And jo Joseph recognized them and was able to forgive his brothers. So what I wanted to share there is for Joseph to finally get to the palace, to finally get to where he was, second in command. We see the favor of God fell upon his life. It took over almost 20 years uh, to get to that point. And we see that the fa famine finally came and we see that the brothers had to come to get food for rations. And, and the story goes that he recognizes his brothers, but the brothers don't recognize him. So he gives them these tasks. He says, I'm gonna, you guys are thieves. You guys came to spy on the land. And, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically put you guys in prison. And they pleaded with Joseph to go back home to go get um, um, Benjamin, the, lo the, the younger brother. And, and they go and get him and they come back. And Joseph is playing this game back and forth with them for a, a couple of times. And then finally, when they all come back, all the brothers are back, Joseph breaks down and he starts crying. And he says, I'm Joseph, the man you sold into slavery. And, and, and it's just such a, a, a touching, touching story because we see that Joseph had forgiveness for his brothers, that he wasn't out to get revenge, even though they deserved uh, revenge for what they did to his life. Uh, 
what I wanted to share with you is he saw compassion on them. He, he, he saw that the reason why he made it to the palace was to help his family in the future. Everything that he went through was for, was for this very moment to be able to help his family, to be able to uh, provide for his family. And we see that the love and compassion that Joseph had for his family is the same kind of love and compassion that God has for us. Even though we, we may fall and, and, and do these things to God, he still always comes at us with open arms. He's always there to lift us up and to have compassion on us no matter how bad we've we've run far away from God whenever we come back he'll always be there to lift us up amen so if you want to do more um, for God this year we have to we have to be forgivers and we see Joseph do that right here you see I listened to a podcast by David Diggett Hernandez a couple months back and he said if you wanted to be an effective Christian you have to forgive daily and he brought up the scripture, Ephesians 4, 32. He says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And this is what he said here. He said, God forgave us, then we have opportunity and obligation to forgive those faster than they can apologize. You see, if we don't forgive, then he says this, if we don't forgive, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And when we don't have forgiveness as Christians, we have to be good and generous with forgiveness. Nothing else demonstrates the grace of God in your life if you forgive what is seemingly unforgivable. So he's saying the best thing that we can do to demonstrate to this world how to be a good Christian, how to be a follower of Christ, is giving forgiveness to those that don't deserve it. To those that are the, the unforgivable, he called it. He said, if you want to be a light and a vessel for God, if you want to be uh, uh, used by God, you have to be able to, you, you have to have an abundance of forgiveness. And, and what I love about this podcast, um, he says that not only uh, do we need forgiveness, but you have to ask God for the memory of the forgiveness as well. He said too many times, he forgives somebody right away and he'll see them a week later and then he just gets all bubbled up again inside and, and, and he has to re-forgive again. See, we have to come to a place where we have to renew our mind daily, amen? God, renew our mind, renew, re, renew the memory uh, that, was, that, was, that was done so I can have forgiveness in my mind, forgiveness for my brother, amen? You see, we have to have this memory of, for, uh, of forgiveness in our mind and also uh, with our brothers and sisters on a daily basis, amen? So can we do that today? Can we have forgiveness like that for people? You see, Joseph understood that all he went through, everything that he went through needed to happen. So he could be uh, placed in a position to save grain and prepare for the famine because of all this. He understood that God had a greater purpose for his life. And that was to save two nations. He was able to save the nation of Israel and the nation of Egypt because he was obedient to the Lord. You see, sometimes we may not understand why we're in the pit. Sometimes we may not understand why we feel like we're in a, a spiritual prison, amen? Sometimes we may not understand, for some of you guys, right, are actually literally were in prison, right? So we may not understand why we were in the prison or, or why, why we had to go through certain temptations or, or, or why we had to go through all these obstacles, but God has a greater purpose and a greater plan for your life. You see, you gotta continue to trust God, continue to keep moving, and continue to, and continue to trust that God is taking you to a better place. In Genesis 50, 20, it says this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for all the good. He brought me to this position so I can save the lives of many. And, and I, I just wanna encourage you guys. Earlier, I started with a dysfunctional family. And, and could it be that you could be the Joseph in the family? Could it be that God is calling you to be a light? to be a vessel, to be the one to forgive, to be the one to be the example to run away from temptation, to be the one to be kind, to be loving, to, to, to overlook offenses. Could, could it be that God is calling you that you will one day have the ability to rescue your dysfunctional family? You see, the Bible says that the entire family came and they went back to get not only Jacob, but his wives and all, um, they got all the... Um, 
all the cows and oxen and everything. They brought all the herds over everything and there was favor upon him from Pharaoh and they gave him a place to settle and to stay. Could it be that God wants you to be that person for your family, to be able to save your family and give them new land, amen? To give them a new life. Maybe, maybe God has, has called you to be that Joseph, to show forgiveness when forgiveness isn't due, amen? Maybe God called you to speak into your brother and sister's life or to speak into your family's life because one day God wants them to be saved just like he rescued Jacob's family. Maybe God wants you to rescue your family, amen? You gotta continue pushing no matter how the dysfunction may look, no matter how bad it may seem, even if, it's, if it seems like it can't happen, if it's impossible, you gotta trust God and believe that there's something greater for you, amen? So we gotta trust the process. We gotta understand that God is aligning us. He's, he's renewing us. He's, he's, um, um, he's molding us and shaping us. And, and I do wanna share this. You know, Joseph had to go through some things and Pastor Omar shared this in one of his sermons. And he said, could it be that Joseph, he was too young, too cocky, and, and, and at 17, when he was telling this dream, he could have been more of like, look at myself, look what God's gonna do. More of like glorifying himself. Like I had this dream and, and, and my bundles were gonna be greater than yours and you're gonna bow down before me. Not really understanding what the dream meant, but kind of being cocky and bold to his brothers. And they kind of took it like an offense. Like what, in fact, they did take it as an offense, right? But could it be that he, he could have been just, you know, a little proud? And, and, and Pastor Omar said this in his sermon. He said, God needed him to go through all of those struggles because if God would have rescued him anytime sooner and he saw his brothers, maybe he wouldn't have forgave him. You know, maybe he wouldn't have the courage to say, you know what, I forgive you. And maybe he would have paid, paid them an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, right? Maybe he would have killed them instead of saving him. But see, God had to mold Joseph into all of these circumstances to be the man that he was at the very end because Joseph understood at the very end what you meant for evil, brothers, God turned it around for good. And that good was to save many lives. And God is calling you guys to be a light and to be a vessel because he wants you to save many lives. He wants you to save your family, your friends, and everybody around you. Listen, I'm telling you, if you're saved and you're a born again believer, listen, you can be a light and a vessel and an instrument to people all around you. You see, Joseph just made right choices and made right decisions and the favor of God fa fell upon him. If you make right choices and make right decisions, you're gonna see the favor of God fall on you and you're gonna see people are gonna clean you. They're going to draw near to you because they're going to want what you have. And you're going to tell them, listen, I have this because I love Jesus. And he gives me all this because I'm faithful. I'm available. I'm teachable. I love saying that, but I just want to encourage you guys today. Don't get discouraged from the struggles. Don't get discouraged from the trials. Don't get discouraged because sometimes you may feel like you're alone and, and, and sometimes you may feel like you're in a hopeless situation and, and you don't wanna be comforted. You're at the point where people call you and you're just like, no, I had enough. I don't wanna do this anymore. I wanna encourage you to keep fighting the good fight. There's more purpose in your life. God is not done with you yet. You were made for more and he's gonna move in your life like never before. And, and, and if, if, if you've turned away from God and you've come back, I'm letting you know, you don't have to start all over, amen? He's here for you. He's gonna put you right back in the position where you left off and he's gonna move in your life, amen? amen? Amen, so can we just go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes? I believe God's moving right now.